Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia Success Podcast, where we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. On this show, I work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. This week, I'm talking to Dr. Krishnan Shakravarti. I really enjoyed this conversation because Dr. Shakravarti really has a knack for not only understanding and developing hyper-specialized technologies, but doing so in a way that understands the business and finance and team building and creating the infrastructure required to take his ideas from the drawing board to changing patients' lives. He has some really amazing stories that he shares from his experiences, and I think you're really going to enjoy today's episode. As always, thanks for tuning in. Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the Anesthesia Success Podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Krishnan Shakravarti. Dr. Shakravarti is doing a lot of exciting things out there on the West Coast with regards to innovation in pain medicine. And I, uh, I'm excited to talk about innovation in the context of the academic setting and also uniting that with industry uh, collaboration. And it's like a, a big tangled ball of yarn that I'm looking forward to unraveling here this morning. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Shakravarti. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me. So I'm interested to know somebody like yourself who's really pushing the envelope with regards to innovation and invention. And I was I was looking at your CV and there was the the all the patents <laughs> that were listed was was significant. So for somebody like you, I'm curious, when did this begin? When for you did you start to create or find that you like to invent stuff, maybe as a child or something? That's a great question. So, you know, um, I definitely took the unconventional route in my medical training. And um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I actually went to uh, University of Chicago as an undergrad. And interestingly, I started as a math and physics guy that was totally interested in nothing science related whatsoever. But um, for most people that are um, of South Asian descent, typically Indian families are always like pushing towards doctors. That's kind of the doctor engineer um, pathway that most things happen. So, um, I, you know, I started taking some biology courses and I was like, oh, this is interesting. But, you know, economics and finance was where uh, my heart was. So um, finally, I got into one of my pre-med advisors like, oh, you should think like an MD, PhD program, you know, that's uh, fantastic. Little did I know how long that program is, but yeah. um, that really changed, um, changed my life in a lot of ways. So I ended up finishing college a little early. I spent a year working in finance and I came back to SUNY Buffalo. Hmm. So I did my first two years of med school and um, I got into this, uh, you know, originally I wanted to do really cancer oncology research. I was totally into drug delivery. So my first choice for a mentor, actually my uh, co-MD PhD candidate um, ended up taking that person. So we could only do one lab per person. Hmm. And it just ended up happening. I worked with uh, probably one of the most influential people in my life, Dr. Paul Knight in uh, SUNY Buffalo. Incredible. I mean, he is one of the most well-read, uh, well-balanced. Um, and in that three years in graduate school, like I felt was just an incredible experience. I mean, everything from getting on a sailing boat to racing on the uh, Niagara to all the way where I spent um, at least a year or two at the CDC developing vaccines for pandemic flu. And it was just at the tail end of my third year that I came back and um, I had done a lot of cool stuff with the 1918 strain, which I'm going to tell you a lot about where it's really applying to this generation of COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and at the time when I came back, um, I had one of my senior MD PhD guys. He was like, Oh, you know, there's just like business plan competition you should like get involved in. It's really cool. You like link up with some key people in the business uh, community and you kind of have different ideas. So I was like, oh, you know, I mean, what's, you, this is a good experience. Why not? So I've been working with a lot of nanotechnology and drug delivery um, parts for flu and 1918 strain. So I came back and I had no intention of doing anything with it other than just pitching. So we ended up working with uh, four of us all together we created this whole company called NanoAxis, and it was really cool. We were working with um, semiconductor particles. So IBM at that time had developed um, quantum dot technology for a lot of the things you see today, like LCD uh, displays on your Samsung or flat screen and OLEDs, right? 
So at that time, we were really interested in using that for marking different biological applications. So we were using it to tag different cell types. And the cool thing is like the description of what industry at that time had was something like, if I were describing Justin today, I'd be like, hey, there's, he's wearing an orange shirt, he's wearing glasses and he's got black hair, et cetera. Um, with that technology, you could get to like such a fine articulation. Um, you could say, you know, Justin is uh, having one speckle on his left cheek to that level of granularity. And so we were doing all this stuff. And then all of a sudden we went from 30 companies to winning that year. And, and that changed my life because that was the first attempt at entrepreneurship. And I really um, ended up loving that process. And it, it's had its own headaches because I was trying to manage a small business while in medical school. So I was traveling um, all over the world, went to Saudi Arabia, China. Um, we were doing all kinds of interesting things with that. But um, I mean, the lesson came in that I was like, wow, I've got a, a totally different perspective on how medicine and business can interrelate through that experience. Yeah, that's awesome. And as a fellow entrepreneur, obviously, I, I'm energized in the same way where you had that experience like this is awesome. I that's how I feel about my endeavors. But you mentioned something that you just kind of glossed over that I want to go back to real quick. This story about racing a sailboat or something on the Niagara River. Can you just share a little bit about what that was? Yeah, so my, uh, my mentor was like, hey, listen, uh, me and my wife do some sailing on the, on the weekend. You should just come down. And it's, you know, I was like, wow, okay, sailing with, uh, with my PI and his wife must be a simple thing. So I get there on the first day and um, I, you know, so little, I, I'm not a really good swimmer, uh, I'll just be honest. Um, so I get there on the first day and I'm like fully in a life jacket. He's got this 40 foot Morsi that he, um, we go on the Niagara river. So I get there and I'm like, Oh, okay. So this is going to be like, you know, some, um, you know, wine and cheese on his deck and it's going to be this <laughs> quiet event. And so he's like, well, no, I didn't, I don't, I didn't mean it like that. I want you to actually just be on my crew. And I, and I see like six or seven people come in. He's like, um, Chris, you're going to be on the four deck and you're going to be putting up the spinnakers and tacking and this. Sounds like you got Shanghai. I know it was unbelievable, but the experience of being in a team effort where you're racing together, mm. I mean, man, the two years there, it was unbelievable. So we would go and race like 10, 12 boats across the river and you would like literally it would get really intense, but um, you learned how to work with other folks. It was, it was an, a fascinating experience. So that's cool. Uh, Nothing short of a full-fledged uh, graduate training, I guess. Yeah, that's excellent. So you mentioned something, and I'm interested in, to get your thoughts on this. So I'm in Philadelphia, which uh, Ben Franklin, a very famous citizen, and obviously an inventor and innovator, he lived, I was thinking about this this morning, he lived in an age when somebody like him, who is sort of the classic Renaissance man, you know, founded the first public library and the first public hospital and the volunteer fire department, as well as like some actual, you know, the lightning rod, bifocals. And I found out this morning in researching for this call, a flexible catheter. None of us want to live in a world without those. Um, and he was able to have these very broad, you know, innovations in lots of different spaces. And he was able to do that just sort of through intuition, I think, and his, the genius of who he was. We live now in an age where it requires, at least this is my opinion, I want to hear your reaction to this, requires hyper-specialization for a long, long time. I mean, you're talking about quantum dot technology and you were, you know, you've got a PhD and the, you need to go so far in one direction before you finally hit that mo the frontier, really. Um, talk a little bit about some of the, the technologies that you've interacted with that have sort of blazed the trail for some of the work that you have done, as well as is there anything that you see right now, either in pain medicine or healthcare more broadly, that, that you think is a more funda more equivalent to like the lightning rod or bifocals where somebody just came up with this idea that was so revolutionary that it, they're not even standing on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. They just sort of had this epiphany that, and, and transformed things. I, I'll tell you what I'm working on, which is really interesting. So I agree with you. I mean, um, you know, that experience, interestingly, that nowadays, if you are an entrepreneur, to really get um, people to believe in you, you almost have to have an expertise in your domain mm -hmm. in a way that, um, you know, you look at the innovation cycle, maybe at the time of Franklin, the more fundamental innovations were 
not discovered, it doesn't mean that it was any less or more challenging. But when you're thinking about what to innovate in, you almost have to be 10,000 steps ahead of where the field is. Because what you're thinking today, you see in a commercial setting was probably thought of 20 years ago. And it's amazing how long that pathway is and how challenging it is. So a lot of people think, well, you know, how hard is it to do a startup? It's only after you've done it a couple of times, failed at it multiple times, do you realize like how many pieces, how much luck and interfacing it has to happen. So I'll give you a good example of what I'm working on. Um, you know, I love the neuromodulation space. I think it's a fascinating space and I've been involved in it the last three years. I interact with industry all the time. But you really made a cool, cool concept or a question. How do you really get at the ground level? Because most clinicians, I think, when they want to be innovative, either they take the setting of being at the end of when a technology gets developed in a lab or spun out in a commercial entity and you're testing it clinically, but how do you generate the idea at the fundamental level? So one of the things that we're working on, which is really, I think, uh, interesting, and I, um, so I was, I collaborate with a, a professor at, in the engineering department and uh, he does a lot of wearables. And so, you, you know, one day I'm, walk, I'm in the lab and I'm like, well, you know, it'd be interesting. What would be really revolutionary in the neuromodulation field? So one of the, I mean, sometimes thoughts are in, you know, you get it at the moment and you think about what to do. So what I'm, what we're really working on and what we believe in the next 10, 15 years is, can you imagine a day where you're, um, we are marriaging the ability for two separate fields of electrical current with biofuel? So meaning that imagine a single catheter being placed in a patient with no external battery, with no uh, recharge burden, and in, in a constant flow of electrical activity that is powered by the human body that would actually have no involvement with any external electronics. So that to me would be a radical idea. Why? Because today, the cost of these devices are up in the 50,000 plus. But pain is such a pervasive thing all across the world what if you could bring the cost down to under a hundred dollars for a single device? I mean, that would be so radical a shift that I, I think the field would see that in 15, 20 years, maybe, uh, um, you know, family medicine doctors are placing stem devices in their office. And that's kind of the vision that you would think about. Now, when I first proposed this, people are like, are you, are you kidding me? This is like so matrixy and like yeah. the idea of using a human as a power source, but I mean, it's fascinating how far science and ingenuity is in applying that. Now, the different part of that is how do you get grants? How do you develop it? How do you I, develop patents around it? But that's always challenging. But I, I can tell you, I think to innovate now, you almost have to think very, very uh, far ahead on what you think is going to be groundbreaking 15, 20 years from the day that you're developing it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm curious, you know, Whenever you are thinking about your medical career, obviously neuromodulation uh, and pain management more broadly has a, a large segment of its practitioners coming through the anesthesiology specialty. At what point did you know that anesthesia was where you wanted to be? And did you see that as like the, the gateway to innovation for you? Or did you kind of just fall into it? Yeah, so I, I was surprisingly, I had, I had matched in both neurosurgery and anesthesia mm -hmm. at the end of medical school. And then, uh, of course, uh, my mentor was like, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you have a very strong research aptitude. So you picking anesthesia as a field um, might lend itself to more easier compartmentalization of your time, right? Nowadays, a lot of fellows, I think the challenge that they have is they come in and they have all these ideas and visions about what their career should be. Um, earlier planning helps a lot because I always tell fellows, like, if you want to do the academic career and you want to integrate research and make that a priority, you need the time. Time is an extremely valuable resource. We all go through it, whether yeah. what you're interested in your personal life, or your career, how you want to spend that time. Um, and so I always tell fellows, like, if you have a vision of what you want, most times academic departments will allow you to do that as long as you've demonstrated some aptitude for that. Mm -hmm. So I took anesthesia as kind of that way of being like, okay, I can have a very easy, uh, very structured three days and it's not as intensive surgically to be involved. But who'd have figured I went back into pain and now it's like going back to the other side of the curtain and 
doing that. But I mean, that experience really was, uh, was telling because it, it functioned really well when I was trying to get a job right out of fellowship where I really uh, asked for protected time. And since that point, we've really, that's been the catalyst for development of all the stuff that we've been doing. Yeah. I'm curious when it comes to leveraging your time and protecting your time, this is sort of the, the one problem that's common to all humans who are really striving to achieve. You just bump into that 24 hour finish line and you're like, Oh crap. Like, you know, that's it. So I'm curious, do you have any, at a very like practical level, do you have any tools or things that you've implemented in your life to help you get more done? Yeah. So, I mean, in, the, in this day and age of the iPhone, my, if you ask my wife, she's like, you're, I feel like you're married more to that than uh, spending time with a family. But I mean, she says it with some uh, joke, but I, I, I think, look, I, I really try to structure my weeks very consistently. So I, uh, I think about, um, and this is a good way to think about how to innovate too. Um, I look at my three days clinically and I derive a lot of, even, you know, my first couple of years, I was only 40% clinical and 60% research. Um, in my days when I'm clinical, even as I'm working with patients, I'm always in the back of my mind thinking about what can I do to ease the way patient care delivery is. So a lot of people say, where does ideas get generated? And mm -hmm. really in my mind, great translational research is understanding the patient care and how do you uh, identify problems that you can improve at the technology level. So, you know, I kind of merge that part of it when I'm with patients, I deliver the best care possible. But I'm also thinking about solutions that I can provide or think about in my uh, using my engineering kind of skill sets. So, you know, those two days, I'm completely dedicated to the clinic, but then the latter three days or two days, I'm very much structured on uh, only meetings that I think are productive. I find a lot of times, I, I think a lot of people waste time on emails and, um, you know, I find that to be completely like a time consuming and time sink. So I, I actually am a big proponent of, you know, if you have tangible objectives that you want to get done, I finish those. And you'll be surprised, you know, you go a week without an email and you can't come back, even though your inbox is littered with thousands of things, probably only about five or 10 are actually actionable. So yes. I try to make things like very practical and to do, and it really helps. And so incorporating exercise, I mean, I'm pretty structured about stuff in the morning. And then um, I do really dedicate family time at the end of the day, like two, three hours. So with a four and two year old, it's kind of, uh, that's a priority. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Maybe you can give us like a 30,000 foot view of all the different, as you're talking about like dividing your time and your attention, what are the things that have your attention? What are the different endeavors you're currently undertaking? Sure. Um, so obviously I'm a clinician. I, I practice, uh, I see both veterans as well as um, I, I see uh, patients as a civilian. Um, I am running a $10 million NIH funded lab now through both private and academic industry. So we are working on everything from um, novel drug delivery uh, on patches to we're now developing this new, we just got a big $3 million grant from NIDA where um, you can imagine we're developing a grain size sensor that continuously monitors opiate alcohol levels in patients and it's synced in with the cloud. So that's going to happen probably in the next three to five years. You'll see it in the market where, um, you know, for addiction patients, this is going to be a fascinating way of recording things and really point of care. Um, I've got, uh, so between that and the five startups that I've launched that are starting to now, um, we're doing everything from, we're developing a new drug now for both uh, intrathecal as well as um, IV use for post-operative pain. And great stories of how that got developed. But, uh, you know, I started it with a research and then ended up kind of shifting this strategy to a startup. And then we're doing a lot of stuff with uh, nanotechnology and yeah. biofuel. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've got my hands in everything. So, but the way I compartmentalize is really I structure weekly to bi weekly follow up meetings on each of these things. And I just kind of make sure that progress goes through. But I, I tell you, those experiences when I was in grad school and doing my first startup really got me to think about how to actually take technology out of the out of the academic center into the marketplace. Yeah, 
Um, I want to direct our listeners to your website, shakravarthilab.com. We'll link to that in the show notes. So if you go to anesthesiasuccess.com slash 59, all the different uh, things that we're going to reference here will be listed. But I thought this was interesting. I was, as I was perusing this website, I had these visions of one of the Batman movies, the earlier ones where Morgan Freeman is like showing Christian Bale around in the basement of Wayne Enterprises, like this crazy thing and that, like all the cool technology. I was thinking like, this is essentially the neuromodulation equivalent of Wayne Enterprises was what I was envisioning. Um, so tell us a little bit about what is the lab? What's your team look like? What kind of work are you doing there? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think we have um, usually between about 10 to 15 everywhere from master's, graduate student. They all come from international environments. And when I'm looking at high, getting people in my lab, I really like folks that are uh, multidisciplinary, things that, you know, even you don't have to have any background necessarily in the things that you do. But what I really look for is people that are passionate for the types of things we're developing. And you'd be so surprised. I mean, I, I think um, that's where kind of now our generation of mentorship and um, getting getting the younger generation. I mean, I consider my, I'm feeling like I'm getting older by the day. My birthday was last Saturday, but um, you know, I, I see a lot of folks that are coming out. Like you just really, given the right uh, opportunity and resources, people can really flourish. And so um, I let people kind of come to the lab, see what kind of ideas that they have. And then I really encourage them to develop that. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to, when you're doing mentorship, to forget that it's not really about your lab. It's about developing that person to be an independent investigator or clinician or successful. And I think that's a very different exercise. I think you have to really put their uh, encouragement of their ideas and help them develop that independently in the absence of really focusing on Oh, I have an idea and I just want to plug you in to get that work done. So I've taken that approach. It's, it's been amazing. I mean, we've got folks from all over the world that come in and work with us. And um, I interact with uh, uh, Joe Wang, who's actually um, one of the prolific engineers, I mean, highly cited in the world. And that's been very helpful with terms of our partnership. So yeah, awesome. yeah, I can. yeah, it's been a great environment. I'm curious, uh, you know, you've, between the lab and you mentioned five startups, this is, this is, it, it takes a lot of people to run this much infrastructure. You talked a lot about team building and like, I'm curious, you know, do you have like a personal philosophy for finding somebody who you think will be a good team member? Or how do you know someone's a good fit? Or when you're thinking about, if somebody's out there thinking, oh, I have an idea, I need to turn it into a startup with a team with infrastructure where we can do a thing and move a project forward. How would you advise them to like begin the team building effort? That's, that's an amazing question. So, you know, it's fascinating. You ask a majority of VC firms or investors, what do they invest in? Is it really the idea? And most times the core statement you'll hear, you know, we're investing in the team. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Like I, I think there are so many great projects people have and people have a vision and without the right team, it can fall apart or it can make it happen. So, um, you know, that old adage, fail quick and fail, uh, it's okay to fail, but fail quickly. Um, and I think I apply that a lot to things like, especially with new idea generation, because if you're spending a lot of time, you're not getting constructively anywhere. I almost feel like it's okay to say, you know what, this is not going to work and part your ways, don't burn bridges. I think the challenge that most people have is they really get uh, kind of focused too much on how much of this is my share of the pot like and in fact the reality is that you know you build something together with a lot of people and if it's successful you'll naturally be successful so i, I think you most dynamics for most teams i'll tell you uh, within a span of like a month or two you'll know if it works or not like and it's very clear and i i and i think as i've done more of this i've started to get less tied to an idea about necessarily seeing its success and you're not married to it. And I think it helps you take a step back and say, okay, I love this. This could be revolutionary. This could be really game changing, but I really can't work with Joe and uh, Jason together. It just doesn't work. I mean, they don't get along. So, and it, it happens. I mean, I think it gets pretty, um, you'll see that I, I think any idea that you really want to vet the team out first, mm -hmm. you want to really have a relationship where you can be honest with each other. And so, um, sometimes it works well and other times you can't work, make it work. So tell me about uh, a time when you had to 
evaluate and then perhaps abandon or significantly restructure one of your endeavors? Yeah, so I, um, you know, one of the things we've been developing is a um, interesting new lead design. And at the initial stage, we um, started with a, uh, and partnered up with an older professor and engineer, very set in his ways. And so we had brought a, a, a guy that was much more business oriented and really in the field. So we were trying to work together. And, and you know, like the first just the way that they would approach it. He would, he was very academic in his way. He would be like kind of hard to really get down to flow, um, flow sheets and Excel spreadsheets and cash flow. And I, I, at the early part of this, I could sense that there wasn't a lot of synergy. Yeah. So long story short, um, you know, I made the decision. I was like, look, I, I don't think this is going to work with all three of you guys and uh, us as a partnership. Um, you know, can we find some ways to kind of maybe go our separate way and, and maybe figure out a different approach? And that story short that, uh, you know, one, one of the team members obviously didn't feel that it was a good fit. And then we kind of set, set that apart and we went different ways. Now, I'm sure that team member probably thought that the idea was not going to be successful, but it did, you know, and I ultimately, as much as I wanted it, he wanted it to fail. It actually went, um, went quite far and, and we're still developing a lot of the stuff, but the point was, you know, I, I think that fundamental switch sometimes, uh, having opposite ideas in a, in a room can be very helpful to make sure that you're not married to it, to the point you're not seeing the pitfalls, but at the same time, you want to make sure that it's not so, uh, there's not so much impediment to movement forward that, you know, you're not able to marriage different personalities together. So yeah, it worked out, but it was are there any commonalities that you've seen between the different, you know, maybe you've got five different startups, you've got the lab, you probably have other things that you haven't even mentioned, but if you're, if you're saying, I want to get a group together to achieve a purpose, are there different sort of seats you're trying to fill that are the same between those, or does it depend on the project and the org? No, I, I think, look, I, so I, I go back to um, Robert Langer out of MIT. I don't know if it, most folks know, I mean, he's incredibly successful. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think, he makes up a good point, and I find this. You really want to identify individual skill sets in a team. You don't really want to have too much of the same. So if you think someone is really strong in the technical part, you know, you really want to um, support that. If you think someone's really good with the finance, if you think someone's really good with operations, then I really think about each of those pieces. Um, the challenges in the initial part of a startup as a leader who's waiting for it to germinate, you almost have to be cross-functional across every different aspect of it. Um, but even, even just being creative around patents, how do you think about patents? How do you really get the claims to help you develop something that can go into the market? Um, all of that you're gonna have to, and it's a really steep learning curve, but you learn it. And so I, I try not to reproduce that because I think having a, a little bit of an understanding of each of those different pieces helps. Um, but, you know, I think there isn't a sure formula on that. I, but it's, it's worked for me, but I think I'll make one other point. Um, it's really important. I think that people also recognize when an idea is ready for commercialization. So some people get this concept and they're like, okay, I think I could sell this for millions of dollars. But the reality is, it takes a ton of effort. It's very fairly, uh, you know, you have to reproduce it. You got to have a prototype. You got to have IP. You have to have a lot of money till the point where an investor actually takes you seriously. And so I think sometimes people think it's easier and then get frustrated. And then they're like, man, that's, that's actually more challenging. But I think as you get more experiences, it can be really rewarding, I think. Yeah. So. One of the interesting things that I found about the pain medicine space is uh, just the dynamics of innovation and how much it is just because of the nature of who's got the money to spend on R&D, how much it is often driven on the private practice side and on the industry side. And, uh, you know, we mentioned before our, we, hit, we hit record here, um, innovation in the academic world, especially, uh, you know, because of the like legal and intellectual property complexities and like who's going to get what and who's going to pay for what and how does, you know, UCSD and like Abbott, how do, if they went in on a thing or other stakeholders, like how does all that work? And, for some, in some ways, like just doing it all off the acad outside of a 501c3, it's probably cleaner or at least it's simpler. Um, I'm fascinated to hear how did you, you know, as you're thinking about what you want your life and career and 
you know, five startups to look like doing that as a, having the academic center at the hub, how did you think through that? And who did you lean on to help you evaluate the best way to build that? It's an awesome question. So this actually is a lot of questions across the country that people ask this. Um, so, you know, um, when you start, I think, look, I, even let's say, take an example, DRG stimulation, right? That today is a commercial thing. It actually came out of a academic university and developed at even Nevro in some ways that became a big commercial entity. The, the truth is that most times, I think if you, most academic centers are actually very pro spin-offs and commercial enablement. In fact, they set up what, what these, what are called tech transfer offices that essentially take technology that faculty develop and then help them transition to a commercial setting. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, I think it's a little bit of a different exercise. So most people, I can get a grant today and as a faculty member, I develop it. I file a patent through the tech transfer office and that's intellectual property that's owned by the university. The, the transition though is that at some point, if you then want to create a company, that company would then license that intellectual property from the university and then have you know, that negotiation of what that university would have in relationship to that company. So classic example, Gatorade out of University of Florida. Today, I mean, even some portion of that royalty is what's made UF so, it's been an incredible experience with the success of Gatorade, right? Or even some other, um, even look at Google and their endowment at Stanford. So what happens is that I think, depending on the health system, the challenge that comes is people feel, well, how much am I giving up because I'm at a university setting and this private entity, is it going to give up 75% of the company just to get the intellectual property? Or is it going to give up 5%, 10%? Most universities, if you, what they're really looking for is success. So they don't, yeah. it's not that they're opposed to you taking a license of that uh, intellectual property. They really want to know that you're going to develop it in a meaningful way because they get approached by the Abbots, the Medtronics of the world all over the you know, every major university has an IP tech transfer place and they can license or not license to an individual thing. So I think they're preferential to inventors, but in general, you really have to show credibility of being able to license and actually do something with it. So I didn't learn that till I had done the business plan competition. And so we actually really worked with University of Buffalo about how to actually license some of the quantum.ip and really got into the manufacturing. So um, what I would say is, I think it's not, it's not that difficult, but I go back to the point I made earlier. You know, um, it's fascinating. If you're developing something for money, it's very different than people developing something that they're passionate about and money is a byproduct. And why I say that is, when people get hung up on, oh, how much percentage am I going to own? Is the university going to have this or that? I really believe like if you're owning 2% of Google today is very, it's success. Because the people who, the, the, the founders actually think about how much money am I going to make or were they totally focused on what am I actually doing for society or how is my getting my technology out to people? If that becomes the focus, I think people will start to realize it's actually easier to work in these academic centers. And I think that's, if you're passionate about that, then I think less emphasis comes into, uh, you know, I got to give up this or that to build a team. So, you know, I, I, I personally feel, I think less focus on money as opposed to the technology and the impact on society actually helps kind of move that along. And that's kind of the irony, right? Is when you get a, an organization with a bunch of people who are so invested in the vision, they're in the foxhole together they're able to weather, you know, the, the storms more effectively than people who all rally around the mighty dollar. And uh, that just will not galvanize a team, right? As I'm sure you've probably seen. Yeah, I mean, you hear all the great innovators in our space, jobs, you look at, I mean, I, I don't think no, nobody, I think their vision probably at that time, people were like, wow, how is this any what profitable? Like, yeah. but at the, the thing is that if you take a look at that innovation cycle, it's really because they, foresaw a, a vision that might have applied 10, 15 years later. And it, it, the, the rest of it kind of flows after you think. 
that's not to say you shouldn't have a proper business model because at the end of the day, no one's going to invest if they don't think you're going to make revenue. But I think the emphasis on specifics like, hey, how much is this component am I going to give up or not? If you're willing to be a little bit generous on that end, I think a lot of ideas can have uh, fruition after it gets spun out. Yeah, especially at the outset. Then once you have a track record, you've got leverage, right? <laughs> Um, so what you do is very intellectually property, intellectual property heavy, and obviously protecting IP is, I mean, I don't even really know anything about that, but I imagine that it's complex and it takes a team. And so tell me about how did you learn about how to protect the work that you're doing? Who, who did you have to bring on to your team to help you make sure you do that the right way? Yeah. So <laughs> it's really interesting. I, that was my, so the first, um, you know, failure becomes a good way of learning how to succeed. So in our first, um, it's a fascinating story. So in our first attempt at, uh, I go back to this quantum dot uh, example. So at that time, um, in, there was a big company called Life Technologies and they housed almost all the IP in the space of QD and biological application. So what happened was that many companies try to break in and these guys being the 800 pound gorilla would literally just use intellectual property to mm -hmm. legally prevent any company. So what happens is when you're a startup, usually either you get acquired or, and the technology gets shelved right. or bigger companies just, you know, use the tactic of legal ways to enforce, not you coming in. Right. So um, I just remember, so one of my, uh, for me, it started because we went back to a high school reunion and this is how much networking and friendship makes a difference. So one of my closest friends was like, hey, you know, I just got into IP law. What have you been up to recently? And I was like, oh, you know, nice that you asked. I've been working on this thing with uh, QD stuff. And he's like, oh, you know what? We should sit down sometime. And at that point, as a patent lawyer, I really learned all of these fascinating things around um, what claims are, what freedom to operate is. How do you know? that uh, you go from a provisional to a non-provisional patent, like what that allows you to do. So I really say you definitely legal advice early is helpful because you can spend a lot of ideas may actually have no room in the marketplace because you haven't done the actual search. And it costs a little bit of money, but it's worth an investment to know, is there actually IP that you can create? So long story short, after that whole experience, um, we finally got around to it, to figuring out a way to get around the IP, figure out the manufacturing. But I was like, man, this, whoever, this guy that owns uh, life technology is the bane of my existence. Right. So yeah. funny story. Uh, my first year I go to San Francisco and um, I give a talk on drug delivery and two of the guys that are like, Hey, you know, you should, you should meet our founder. Um, he's a great guy. He's like, we, we're uh, out in the Southern tip of Marseille. This is where, of course, clearly that's where the headquarters are. So like, we'd love to fly you out there. Um, so I get out there and uh, there, it's this beautiful vineyard and I'm meeting the founder. I'm like, wow, this has got to be exciting. I'm like really amped up. So I sit down and there's this Vietnamese guy in like Hawaiian t-shirt shorts and he's smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, yeah, you know, he's like, oh, tell me about like past experiences. I was like, oh, I had this company in quantum dot technology and you know, it was so interesting, but I had this guy that from Invitrogen and this company kept like, you know, they were always so aggressive. He's like, oh, Invitrogen? Yeah, that was my, my previous startup. So I literally met the guy that founded Invitrogen at that company. I was like, what a small world. I was like, if I known you like five, 10 years ago, maybe it would have been a different experience, but it was such a, you know, it told me how small the world can become, but it was fascinating. So yeah. I was hearing it from his perspective where, he had started the same company from the garage and they had, I mean, grew to a billion dollar enterprise, but unbelievable experience. And so then we kind of, it was like, man, I, I just wished I had known you at that time for all this IP yeah. stuff, but yeah. yeah, small world. Just cause, and it, this is a recurring theme on the show is like, you got to just behave yourself cause it is a small world and treat people right. Uh, because <laughs> they're going to come back around like it or not in the end we're collaborating on some really cool stuff now but yeah. it, it just it tells you that you know never be afraid to meet people and to interact yeah. power is in people and networking i think there's a lot to be said for that what has surprised you most about the the path that you have taken a very precious resource so the choices we make whether it's spending time with our family doing time at 
um, medicine, doing time in research, doing time developing startups, whatever. I think that um, you got to take some risks. And I really do mean that. So um, I, I remember when I did that startup and I tried to continue it during medical school, I was definitely not the fan of my uh, dean who was like, is this guy still interested in medicine or is he trying to manage this or that? But what happened was even my experience going to CDC or doing all of that, I had to take the initiative, mm -hmm. you know? And so part of that is I tell a lot of folks that are interested in, especially fellows, mentorship doesn't mean somebody's going to give it to you on a silver platter. They will guide you. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to really be passionate and take that step of hard work in the choices that you make. So um, I have taken very unconventional steps in my life, whether it's been doing things out of the norm, which, um, you know, even if you ask my <laughs> Dr. Knight, he would be like, yeah, he was definitely not of the run of the mill graduate student. Cause I would, I just went down to CDC for two years and he would be like, wow, that's not typical. But, um, but I'm just, I, I, I think the lesson in that is, be adventurous, take, yeah. take chances on things that may, you know, may feel like a big task, but unless you do it, you'll never know. So. Absolutely. And I think what you mentioned earlier, the, the, the innovation that comes at the crossroads of disciplines, yeah. you can sort of, absolutely. And I think what you mentioned earlier, the, the, the innovation that comes at the crossroads of disciplines, you can sort of create that in your own person. If you throw like what you just described, going to the CDC, PhD in immunology, and uh, the way that that fuses with like the nanotech and, you know, right now it's kind of like, you're almost like the, the perfect storm of like skill sets and the things that you're working on to be able to speak intelligibly into the crazy noise that we're seeing all around us right now. But it just goes to show you that when you're willing to take a path less traveled like that, I've had a, I would say a much more muted, but similar experience with coming up as a financial planner and then throwing myself into anesthesiology and pain medicine and all of the it's just like opportunity and interesting things all over the place that you that you find once you have like a dual specialty or dual interest like that. Yeah, and and look at I mean you I have to say your podcast is so successful because I think you could see you're passionate about this as much as I'm talking about technology and it, it's clear in that aspect of it. So like I commend people who can step out of the box and innovate. I mean that's that's the foundation. I mean, you, you brought up Ben Franklin. He was a classic example of that. Mm -hmm. Things that you would think, oh, this is not something you would think about developing something in. You know, he was never feared, feared about that. And Edison was a, another classic example. of Somebody who was just constantly thinking of new ideas, innovation. So uh, I'm, I'm all for risk-taking. Calculated, I would say. But That's right. That's right. Yeah, me too. Uh, I want to ask you one more question, and I thank you very much for your time today. You have accomplished a lot and achieved a lot in many different domains, and you've, you know, you, you talked about the sacrifice and the time. Tell me a brief story reflecting on a moment of professional actualization when you either patient care or a breakthrough technologically or a business success where you realized all of the elbow grease and all the hours and all of the research, it's in this moment, it has made it worth it. With all the hats that I wear. Um, one of the, you know, one of the most gratifying things, and I still find this to be the case, is an individual patient interaction where I feel that I've delivered a therapy that has changed their life. Amazing. You can look at every uh, technology you develop being at the cutting edge, but um, there's a moment where if, as a physician, when you're in a room and a patient tells you, so I had a case of a patient that had phantom limb pain for 18 years and um he had tried everything he had tried everything at the point of i have medication he tried um all the different alternative therapies he came in he was like i really i'm at a point in my life where i'm crippled i can't function i can't do the things that i want to so net net effect is we we had actually placed a, a, a drg stimulator for him and he had completely the pain had gone but what was impactful was that beyond the outcome, it was when he came back with his family, um, it was his wife and daughter that was very touching. They were like, oh, we had gotten our father back in a way that, you know, I, I think it, it's hard to be in that position, but when you're in it and you're thinking about it from the clinical perspective, it may just be one patient, it may just be one interaction, but for that person, his life had completely changed. And I, I think, 
that to me is a critical driving force in why I work hard on the development of the technology because I'm hoping one day that that's reproducible. So, you know, I, I love being a clinician. I think I would never change that. I think that, you know, I, I, if I could do entrepreneurship and lab stuff five days a week, I could, I could see that being what most people would say to do or give it all, all up and go to industry. But I think from a perspective, the clinical practice of medicine can be extremely rewarding. I mean, and I think that applies, like when you're giving financial advice, I think somebody succeeding can be really rewarding, right? You're like, wow, I've changed their life in a very meaningful way. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I still talk to him today and uh, unbelievable. So, so that's, awesome. I think it's really great. Well, thank you for sharing that story. And Dr. Shakavarthi, thank you for joining us today on the Anesthesia Success Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Justin. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to anesthesiasuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesiology and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I would also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on the Anesthesia Success Podcast.